Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome. I'm uh, Dick Morningstar. I'm the founding director and the chairman of the Atlantic Council Global Energy Center. Uh, and on behalf of the Global Energy Center, I'm pleased to welcome you all to this event, the Road to Bonn Transatlantic Climate Solutions. And we're happy to be co-hosting this event with the German embassy. Germany is obviously a it's Michael Weber there, uh, an extremely valuable uh, transatlantic partner and uh, continuing cooperation and dialogue concerning climate issues is obviously very important. Uh, as a former ambassador uh, to the EU, uh, I'm a firm believer in, uh, in the importance of the transatlantic relationship and, and, and the importance of engaging on these kinds of issues. Now, of course, we all know that back in June, um, President Trump announced that the U.S. would withdraw from the Paris Agreement. Uh, I, you know, I can be very brief in saying that uh, I think that that was a uh, not a very uh, not a very uh, smart uh, decision. Uh, and in fact, it's interesting that this month uh, that Nicaragua announced that it'll join the agreement. So. I guess there are two countries that have not signed on uh, at this point, Syria and the United States. I mean, that's, that's sort of interesting. Uh, I, I do have the experience when I was, when I was at the EU, uh, it was at the time that President Bush uh, decided uh, to exit the Kyoto Protocol, uh, citing similar, similar kinds of reasons uh, at that time. And that decision on Kyoto, uh, similar to this one, uh, has had spillover, had spillover effects uh, into our uh, broader relationships and made it a lot more difficult, I think, back then, uh, and then followed up by uh, uh, the Iraq War, uh, to, conduct, uh, to conduct our foreign policy. I also found at that time that it made it difficult uh, for some of our businesses uh, to operate uh, in Europe. They were constantly getting questions about what, you know, how could the United States have done this? And, uh, uh, and so it, 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 did, it did have an effect. And so, and this also, I think, does isolate us. But having said all that, uh, I don't think it's, uh, my own view is that it's not all gloom and doom. Uh, the cow's already out of the barn. Uh, maybe we won't be having, from a government standpoint, a leadership role, and to some extent, seating leadership, uh, more than to some extent, uh, but to Europe, uh, to countries like China. Uh, but the fact is, we're still doing a lot of things, and we're doing a lot of things at the state level, the local level, uh, business, uh, at the business level, and uh, that I think it's important as we uh, go into Bonn uh, that we emphasize that the that climate change still is very much uh, very much on the uh, American agenda. Uh, there are all sorts of initiatives that uh, I, don't, I won't spend any great deal of time going into. Like we we are still in with 2,500 liters, and I have a whole lot of stuff about that here, but we want to get to the, we want to get to the panel. Uh, uh, so, and then there's also Mayor Bloomberg's initiative. Uh, there are university initiatives. I could go on and on, and I think we'll hear more about that, uh, more about that from, uh, from the panel. But the fact is that cities, states, businesses are moving ahead, <coughs> are moving ahead whatever our uh, government policy uh, may be. And these bottom-up solutions uh, are really critical uh, to this whole effort. So we look forward to hearing more from the panel uh, without further uh, uh, me going on any further. Uh, 
Let me uh, introduce uh, introduce the panel. Um, we have Dennis Tanzler, who's the director of international climate policy at Adelphi. Uh, but Dennis has uh, uh, certainly had a lot of experience on both sides uh, of the ocean, including in the German Foreign Office uh, and uh, in Germany. So I think can g really give a very good uh, uh, vantage inter views from an international vantage point. We also have Ben Grumbles, uh, who's uh, uh, Maryland's uh, Secretary of the Environment. Uh, Ben's duties also include serving as the chair of the governor's Chesapeake Bay cabinet, treasurer of the nine-state regional greenhouse gas initiative, another example of state action, chairman of the Ozone Transport Commission, and a member of the Susquehanna River Basin Commission. And finally, to round out the panel, we welcome Tommy Wells, who's the director of the Department of Energy and Environment for the city of Washington, D.C. Uh, and so I'm sure we're all, you know, seeing that we're sitting here in Washington, D.C., who have interest in what is, what's happening here. Uh, the panel will be moderated by Randy Bell, who I am pleased to introduce as now the managing director uh, of the Global Energy Center, uh, and uh, he'll he'll moderate. And uh, I want to remind you that this is a public event; uh, it's on the record, and so uh, look forward. I know we all look forward to some uh, very uh, informative uh, discussions. So I'll turn it over to you, Randy. Thank you, Dick. Uh, welcome, everybody. Welcome, panelists. Uh, Dick sort of said it all. Uh, we're here to talk about what uh, what is being done and what can be done at the state, local, grassroots, corporate level uh, to uh, to mitigate climate change, to uh, work on climate action uh, uh, on the road to bond and po post bond. Uh, we have some great panelists here, and just. Um, we have also some great people from the private sector in the audience who are working on these issues and people from any number of organizations. So I hope that there's a good Q&A afterwards about uh, what can be done, what is being done. Um, I know, you know this, is, this is the kind of thing where companies are taking huge leadership roles, uh, cities are taking leadership roles, uh, and in the context of a lack of US federal leadership, um, this is the kind of thing that we need to see more of. So I, I appreciate everybody who's here who's doing that. Um, so I hope we can talk more about that afterwards. Uh, we'll turn to Dennis to get started with his remarks. Yeah. Thank you very much, and uh, also for this invitation and uh, being part of this um, important conversation. Uh, a few days before the um, Bonn Climate Conference is, is about to start, actually by many con considered as a more technical meeting, um, but I but I dare to say at this point um, there is actually no no technical climate conference or not at least not only a technical climate conference, and that has also to do with the increasing role of um, non-state actors, including cities, including companies, that um, are more and more part of, of getting to these kind of conferences, um, outlining what is their uh, main strategy and what um, over what are overall experiences to to um, also to provide leadership, and that is basically um, a result um, of a main failure um, back in 2009. Um, with the Copenhagen conference at that time, there was a lack of global leadership, and and afterwards more and more um, this this whole climate governance process um, was changing to a uh, has been changing to a, um, a mixture of of top down bottom up um, uh, approach, and that is very important um, also with with some processes like the um, Lima Paris Action Agenda involving many many. Um, uh, initiatives and uh, companies and uh, more than 2,000 cities basically outlining as part of the um, an overall platform what they are doing basically in order to reduce <coughs> greenhouse gas emissions and what kind of needs they have and um, also presenting their very specific narratives um, in in this in this context so actually why cities cities are um, uh, of course um, um, a relevant factor when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions with more than at the global level about 80 percent of greenhouse gas emissions but they are also very vulnerable uh, to climate change think about for example um, coastal cities um, uh, are susceptible to sea level rise in in some areas um, um, there are um, also fragile cities where and the whole thing is, is, is turning also to be a um, um, foreign and security issue um, so um, at that time um, when this um, whole um, a few years ago this this process started now um, we, we can see that um, there are more and more cities uh, trying to take um, uh, the lead here um, and of, of course this is overall a question of 
of, of coordination um, with the respective um, um, governments, um, national governments, maybe um, also uh, state actors. Um, it's um, a question of strategy and planning because um, most of the cities um, have normally um, not, um, let's say, too too many resources in this regard, and to to also to reflect on on climate um, um, on, on climate data in uh, yeah. first hand, but also other um, elements. And it's um, also um, um, a question of financing, which is very important because um, you need to get access to any kind of, of, of funds. Um, some some. Um, cities are better off um, in, in, in this regard, and um, what we can see uh, is that uh, overall, um, um, under um, uh, in such a perspective, that um, cities um, can serve as alternative fuels for this Paris Agreement implementation process. Um, that is very important. But um, on the other hand, that they um, they need a due recognition um, that they are part of the game, um, be it as part of the national um, climate contribution by the. Um, different um, parties, be it uh, that they get access also to additional finance. Um, just before we go on to Ben, you know th what what's interesting here is that uh, you're coming from Germany, uh, which at least uh, has taken a leadership role uh, on, on climate action, though is maybe struggling to meet some of its 2020 targets. But you want to come here and talk with our state and local folks. What's the motivation for coming uh, coming from Germany to get the U.S. involved more at a state and local level? I think what we um, have been observing um, in the United States and, and the ambassador um, already mentioned it that um, also at the time when when uh, George W. Bush uh, went out of the Kyoto Protocol that there were quite a uh, number of, of, of cities and, and mayors coming in with um, trying to to take the lead um, in, instead and um, from from this time um, ongoing there are quite a number of different approaches um, very city specific sometimes um, but also overall as, as part of um, city cities networks um, like the covenant of mayors on climate and energy and so there is um, for um, in, in a transatlantic um, um, perspective but also overall in um, taking um, or, or using examples in, in India, in Brazil, in, in other countries where you can learn and, and try to, to figure out what kind of capacities are needed, what kind of innovative solutions are there um, to learn from that. And that is um, then to, to um, also um, have some uh, joint events um, as part of this um, climate caravan um, moving now to, to Bonn um, to, to showcase what, what is, are we actually doing. And for example, since you also mentioned it, what, what kind of cooperation do we have with the private sector in order to deliver one or the other solution? Yeah. I mean, from my perspective, it seems it's, it's crucial that we have states and cities continuing to act just as a way of demonstrating that there is some sort of U.S. leadership, even if it's not happening at the, or, or weakened at the federal level. Um, so I, on that, I, I, you know, we very much appreciate having Ben and Tommy here who can talk about that. Um, so Ben, why don't, we, why don't you go ahead and talk about what Maryland is doing? Uh, from, I mean, it is with the Chesapeake Bay, uh, uh, one of the uh, sort of ground zeros mm -hmm. of climate change with sea level mm -hmm. rising and, and the land actually sinking, so you have a double whammy. Mm -hmm. um, what, is, what is Maryland doing to, uh, to combat climate change? Well, happy Halloween, everybody. Uh, <laughs> it's a, a, a scary scenario if, if, we, if we don't take positive steps to reduce the risks or, or uh, to reduce the risk, or as uh, Someone once said, uh, when you look at mitigation and adaptation, it's all about avoiding the unmanageable and managing the unavoidable. And some of the unavoidable is uh, sea level rise and subsidence and extreme weather events. Uh, you know, we have to prepare for those, and that's called good governance, and, and that's one of our areas of focus. But um, Maryland is delighted to be going to Bonn. I, I'll be there, and, and it will be to wave the flag that says there are about a dozen states uh, who are united in fighting climate change, reducing greenhouse gases, uh, and, and recognizing that uh, local action and regional action and global action are all important and necessary. Maryland. It has been and continues to be, under Governor Hogan, a leader in environmental protection, and that includes uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Last year, he signed legislation uh, to uh, reduce our uh, greenhouse gas emissions levels uh, 40 percent, based on 2006 levels, by 2030. 
And the magic of that was that that legislation said reduce uh, uh, emissions 40% by 2030 while ensuring net positive impacts to jobs in the economy. And so we're tracking that. We're working with the Chamber of Commerce. We're working with the universities to uh, make sure that uh, it's a balanced approach. Um, our state is not only committed with a 40 by 30 aggressive goal on reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but we are also uh, committed to robust, collaborative, bipartisan discussion. We have a 26-member state climate change commission that develops recommendations to the state legislature and the governor on mitigation and adaptation and science and, and public education. Um, and then the last point, one that I'm really looking forward to talking with global leaders and, and uh, people from around the world in, in, in Bonn uh, in November is uh, regional leadership. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, Maryland is one of nine states that participate in the uh, Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, or uh, REGI as we call it. And that is uh, the first and uh, by far, from our perspective, the most effective and meaningful way to put a price on carbon to reduce emissions, to generate revenue that can then be put into energy efficiency um, and uh, renewables. Uh, so our state is very much engaged in, uh, we have a, a renewable portfolio standard and we are absolutely committed to uh, local and regional efforts. I, I would just tout wearing my uh, REGI Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative hat. Um, our uh, region, regional initiative, we're very proud of the fact that among the nine states we reached a consensus agreement about a month ago to continue that regional cap and trade program through 2030 and to strengthen the cap. Um, 30 percent um, reduction in the emissions cap uh, over time. And very importantly, to growing the partnership, the size of the uh, Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. So we're in, in intense discussions with some other states about linking or participating in REGI. And it's just a, a real honor to be traveling uh, to Germany to be part of COP23, to, particularly with the message that Maryland and other states absolutely understand the value of taking action and um, working with partners uh, and transitioning to cleaner energy and, and getting real serious about further reductions in greenhouse gas emissions and making sure that we keep our heads above water, literally. <laughs> in, in uh, Maryland and, and, uh, and recognize that it also benefits the heart and soul of our state economy and culture, and that's the Chesapeake Bay. Fantastic. Um, and I think you know, it's, it's really worth emphasizing, for those who don't know, that um, Maryland, the Mar Larry Hogan, the governor of Maryland, is a Republican. This is a bipartisan issue in Maryland, right. um, and that this doesn't have to be, I think, a political football as, as right. it is so much in the United right. States. Maybe we can come back to that yeah. later. Um, Tommy, over to you. Thanks, Randy, and thank you for inviting me to, to be here as part of the panel. And um, I think I have the lowest travel cost, probably. So. <laughs> <clears throat> but let me say on behalf of our mayor, the, the mayor did reassure, well, went down to um, a meeting in Mexico City last year about this time to reassure the other cities and leaders <clears throat> from across the world <clears throat> that our commitment has not changed at all in working on mitigating climate change, even though that we have a um, federal government that has pulled back. And the reason that's important, as many of you know, and as, as um, Dennis was stating, that almost 80% of all the greenhouse gases are related to cities. 50% of the world's population live in cities. And that is going to go up by another 20% um, um, over the next 20 to 25 years. So cities are the problem, but cities are also the solution. And so recognizing that in Washington, D.C., as a city, we have doubled down on our efforts, and there's nothing like getting really focused because of losing our federal partner. We realize that we have to work more closely with other cities. We have two agreements that we've signed with Copenhagen and Denmark to um, continue to bring best practices to Washington, and 
I am proud of what our city's doing. We're the, just named the first lead platinum city in the world. But it also means that we have to, you know, provide best practices, work with other cities, and also double down on what we're doing. So what cities are doing um, across the world and in America and states too, like Ben was talking about, is that we're setting these goals. How much are we going to reduce greenhouse gases by when? And these goals, there's, there's really efforts to recommit to higher numbers. So we're, we've committed to 50% by 2032 based on 2006 baseline. We're committed to 80% by 2050, but I suspect that's going to change. I suspect that we're going to increase how much we're going to commit to reducing greenhouse gases by 2050 because we have to. <clears throat> so the challenge is, is what's the roadmap to get there? So we just recently finished our, um, our comprehensive energy plan. Almost every state and city generally has a comprehensive energy plan. And what's different about ours, instead of saying how much energy do you currently use, how much are you going to need, what's your growth rate, ours is actually our first roadmap to how are we going to reduce greenhouse gases by the amount that, um, that we've pledged to, and what are the different efforts that will bring about the greatest um, results. So that's helpful to our, to our residents and to our activists because it says this is how much gain you get on, in terms of what you do. So only about 21% of our greenhouse gases in D.C. are attributed to, to vehicle miles traveled. About 74% of the greenhouse gases caused by D.C. are buildings. And so our target has to be buildings. And as you know in D.C., we generally don't like to build buildings and tear them down. It seems like every building that we build gets its own friends of group, depending how bad of an era of architecture that it was, <laughs> and to keep it up. So what we have to do is we have to retrofit the city. And that's going to be very expensive. So we've done a couple of things. We've created something called a sustainable energy utility, which we put a fee on everyone's power bill, raises about 20 million a year. And then we have a nonprofit organization that just works with buildings to change out their bulbs, create better HVAC systems, <coughs> improve their windows, do the things that they need to do that are kind of low hanging fruit to reduce their energy consumption. And then we've also just launched something called Solar for All. Solar for All comes out of an alternative compliance payment. We require buildings that purchase their power. Our power company is not allowed to sell power. So we're just a distributor. Pepco and Exxon is a distributor of power, so you have to buy it. There's a renewable portfolio standard when you purchase it, and a portion of it has to come from solar in DC. We don't have enough solar in DC to purchase, so you have to give us an alternative compliance payment, and we turn those funds back over to, um, to contractors and such to put deep um, solar in DC. Our goal is 5% of our power by 2032 will come from solar power generated in the District of Columbia. So as you can see, we're trying to narrow the amount of, gener of um, power used, and percentage-wise, we have narrowed the amount of power we use in DC, even though our city, as many people know, is growing substantially. Mm -hmm. But the third thing that we're doing, and it's something that I think is taking off across the world, at least in America, is something called the Green Bank. How do you pull all these things together? How do you leverage private funding in order for us to retrofit Washington? And we certainly have um, you know, these, these programs and goals, but to get a building owner to agree to retrofit their building, to leverage especially if they're going to leverage in new technology. The newer the technology, the higher the risk, which means the higher interest payment. It's harder to retrofit building new technologies. And so what we will do with the Green Bank is that we'll take the first loss. If it's going to cost $5 million, we'll put in a million. And if there's any problem in payment, we'll take the first loss. So what we'll do is we'll bring the interest rates down. We'll also partner in some of these activities. And it can be as creative as folks want to be. It could be if we go to having a, um, that everyone has to get a benefit of a certain amount of money if they agree to walk or bicycle to work. It could be bundling um, where businesses get together. They borrow the money from us. They buy their employees that want to do this, bicycles. And we take that as a, um, as a very secure loan that we've given because it's paid for by that fee. And then we, um, 
we bundle these different packages together and we sell them so that we can then get more money to keep loaning more money. Government's used to giving grants, but the idea that you get the money back and then you get to give it out again is a little bit new for some parts of government. So that's, um, that's what we're doing. And again, the, um, I think that the challenge going forward for cities, we have a climate summit in Chicago coming up the first week of December. And I think that we're going to have to talk about what our goal is going to be in 2050. Thinking that far ahead, uh, I guess that's necessary. Thank you. Um, I, I have a question for both uh, Ben and, and Tommy. Uh, playing playing devil's advocate just a little bit, um, doesn't this somehow seem futile from uh, you know, working at the state and local level when the, the problem is really global, um, where where the impact that you know a city like DC can have or a state like Maryland can have ultimately is not going to solve the problems that Maryland will face, um, and Following that, doesn't it set the city or the state up at an economic disadvantage, uh, where you're spending all this money on this expensive equipment and others are not uh, required to do so? Um, no and no. <laughs> Tell me why. Yeah. Uh, so uh, a that was the answer I was yeah, looking yeah, for. Yeah. But. Well, a defeatist <laughs> attitude would be uh, it is futile, futile, futile. Uh, maybe futile. Futile. Too. Futile. Yeah. Uh, Definitely futile. To, uh, bury your head in the sand and say, we, we need a global solution. We need international uh, and national leadership, and not state and local leadership. I, I think it's, you know, from, from a Maryland perspective, the public of, is, is uh, so strongly supportive of think globally, act locally, that message, and that it, it, um, it is just something that's ingrained in, in the state. It's also about economics. I mean, the, the governor's message is Maryland is open for business. And the greener, the greater. And the cleaner, the better. And there is a, it, whether, regardless of governmental regulations, the market forces are increasingly leading towards cleaner, more renewable energy choices, transportation, housing choices that uh, leave less of an environmental footprint. Uh, it's good and strategic from a business and economic perspective to be acting at the state and regional levels. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right, there is, uh, there are, um, I mean, we have concerns sometimes about the level playing field issue, which is one of the reasons why we as a state would like to see the regional greenhouse gas initiative, the market for the auctions uh, that power plants have to purchase their allowances. We'd like to see that grow in size. We do have concerns about leakage uh, and, and a, a lack of a level playing field. And, and that's another reason why we think uh, federal action uh, is important. We, we need a federal driver to help um, reduce concerns about the level playing field issue. Yeah, I, th I think that one of the major differences is that this is no longer theoretical. I remember when people said, well, this global warming thing is going to happen, the greenhouse effect, and I remember when it was theoretical, but now it's right in front of us. We're experiencing the last three hottest years on record. I know in D.C. we um, are experiencing climate change in the city. We're having intense storms we've not had before. We're having flooding. It used to be flooding would come from our rivers, and, or the ocean would push our, our rivers up, their, their tidal rivers, and they, um, there's not dams on them. And that used to be kind of our experience. Now we're having flooding in the middle of the city with these rain bombs, these intense storms that we just saw come through the east, eastern area, I guess, night before last, that um, caused an incredible amount of damage. Mm -hmm. People's power is out right now. So when you talk about resiliency in the era of climate change, the next thing that any th you know, thinking person wants to say, and what are you doing about it? So there's this expectation of our citizenry that, OK, we're going to adapt our city. We're going to harden the city in a way so that we don't lose power, so that we don't flood our, our neighborhoods out, and that we don't have the kind of damage that we're seeing from the, the, the hurricanes and the intense storms. 
But at the other side of that, people want to know what are you doing to help mitigate the cause of greenhouse gases. And so that has um, you know, been an expectation of our voters, of our citizens in D.C. especially. But I think the third thing is in terms of economics, the economy. One of the, the greatest partnerships that we have something to show for is cleaning up the rivers right here in D.C. with the partnership with the Chesapeake Bay Initiative with Maryland. And what we see in D.C. is that we used to be a city that was focused towards the middle of the city. And now we just opened an area called the Wharf. And if you haven't been to the Wharf, it's extraordinary. It was a, almost a $2 billion development, and it's focused on the channel, which is the confluence of the Anacostia and the Potomac. And it's an, an incredible economic engine for the city. And we've already seen the baseball stadium and the Navy Yard area. We didn't know that there would be a time when um, part of real estate advertisements say, come live by the Anacostia River, that that would actually <laughs> increase the value of where you're living. Mm -hmm. So the expectations of, um, of investing in the cost of cleaning up the environment and the return that we're getting, I know here in DC, is extraordinary creating a, um, a tax engine to where we have, um, we have budget balances and revenue that would be the envy of any state in the nation because people want to live here, but also the cities are starting to be viewed as a healthy choice rather than a place that you want to get out of. And um, so we believe that cleaning up the air, obviously resiliency, <coughs> all that goes together and it's, it's, a, um, it's an obvious thing that you have to do in leadership. Thank you. Uh, I want to come back to Germany for a moment here. What, what change have you seen in the government's approach to climate policy following the Trump administration's announcement of withdrawal from, from Paris uh, and, and repeal of the Clean Power Plan? And, and what does that mean um, in the, the context of the, most, the recent elections in Germany mm -hmm. um, and the, building the coalition, but also uh, in the context of Germany potentially missing its 2020 uh, emissions targets? Mm -hmm. I mean, overall, I would, would say um, that um, the current situation in the United States um, puts um, some, some more, or, um, yeah, or um, gives some, some more room to, to discuss actually what, what kind of leadership do we know? I mean, we, we t touched upon that this is also um, part of a bottom-up approach mm -hmm. and, a, and a multi-level game in, in a way that you need to see, and that is also true for Germany, that you need to involve um, um, governments at, at different levels, um, that you also need to see how you can, can re-engage with some partners that are maybe more reluctant um, in, in uh, this regard, um, um, and, and to, to see what, what kind of narrative do you actually um, a need vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis the, the U.S. government at this very moment, and I think um, um, Ben and, and Tommy outlined that this is pretty much um, not only a climate-related narrative, but it's one on, on costs and, and, and benefits. Um, it's, it's a broader um, um, narrative that, that we need to see when we are discussing um, our climate policies. That has also to do with um, the um, potential um, relevance of climate change for um, foreign se uh, security policy uh, in a way, so that um, climate change is um, um, uh, pretty likely to trigger um, conflicts um, um, around the world. And that is pretty much describes um, that, that we um, are entering actually um, at, at different levels into a, in a, into a broader discussions. To bring this back, um, and that's a very good question, to bring this back to the, to the home front, so to say. Um, um, from my perspective, it was quite impressive to see that um, uh, climate policy as, as such was not the main issue um, during the um, um, most recent um, uh, German election um, campaign. And that is um, actually a little bit unfortunate because um, uh, election campaigns are pretty much the place to um, try to outline what is your overall um, idea here, um, how you would like to come in. Um, so the um, and exactly what you what you um, uh, mentioned that, that um, we are in um, pretty likely um, in in Germany are missing our 2020 targets, which mm -hmm. is 40 percent 
um, below the 1990 levels. Um, it's not that um, we are too far away, but it's um, uh, we are. Uh, it's pretty much. Um, uh, it's, it's pretty likely that we will, um, there will be 35 percent reductions in 2020. So um, quite something that already ha um, has been achieved. But on the other hand, of course, um, um, for more than 10 years, this 20, um, 20 target with 40 percent was on the table. There have been. Um, learning curves in, in, in this regard, what, where are success stories and where are um, stories that are not really success mm -hmm. stories, um, uh, um, especially with respect to certain sectors like the transport sector, also agriculture is uh, um, where, where more um, activities are needed. And, and part of this um, also um, cost-benefit discussion is to, to um, now also for the neg negotiations of the new government uh, to um, try to address um, these kind of um, uh, sector questions right at the moment when you try to enter into a new coalition. And that is um, pretty complex in, in the moment, but I think it's better to have these kind of discussions right now than to postpone again to, to a later stage, because then sometime we, are, uh, we have 2020 and we will see, okay, there's really um, a lack of, of leadership. Yeah. Um, you know, just thinking about the missing the, potentially missing the target again, is that motivating people uh, at the local level uh, to, to act more, more locally, um, like you're seeing here in the U.S., where um, the withdrawal from the uh, from Paris Agreement is really motivating people to say, you know, the, the we're still in campaign, for instance? Are you seeing mm -hmm. anything like that in Germany, where there's you know, just you're getting more grassroots action because at the, mm -hmm. the top level it's not working? Yeah, I think it's um, uh, uh, in, in a way a similar situation that you have um, also um, uh, bottom-up um, processes, civil societies with, with ideas coming in. Um, you can see this um, very clear when it comes to mobility. Mobility yeah. is not only related to, to climate change, but we have a, a broad discussion right now. What kind of sustainable mobility, what kind of mobility mm -hmm. in, in general we would like to, to have in the, in the next years to, to come. And there are uh, initiatives bottom up, try to um, um, strengthen um, ways of alternative um, mobility in a way, also to strengthen, of course, um, public transport. And, and um, of course, this kind of open debate that you are going to miss um, um, pretty likely to miss the 2020 target can help to um, um, yeah, set free um, um, pr um, uh, competition for more innovations on, on the one hand and on the other hand also to see that you um, now and, and I think Tommy you were, you were referring to this point we also need to see that this is a step-by-step -step approach also with um, respect to a um, uh, uh, long-term strategy for 2050 so actually what the infrastructure you are get, um, uh, building up right now is, is be it um, energy infrastructure, be it uh, um, when it comes to yeah. transport and mobility, will be um, that um, really influencing the greenhouse gas emissions for the decades to come. I mean, Volkswagen has made some uh, interesting announcements about what they're going to do to their fleet, um, that there'll be an electric option for every single vehicle by uh, every company has a different target. It's 2020 mm. or 2021 or something. But in the German context, um, you know, there's a joke in the United States that a Tesla in certain states is a coal powered car. Um, <laughs> And uh, in the German context, that's particularly true um, as it's uh, moving away from nuclear. Is that something, uh, the power sector and really getting emissions down in the power sector, is that something that people are thinking about? Um, I think that's a, a complex um, um, process to, to think about how my, my um, individual mobility is um, um, also related to the overall industry, uh, energy infrastructure um, of, of the country. But in, in fact, there has been missing quite um, a debate about what kind of mo mobility do we um, need and do we want. Mm -hmm. So, um, and this, this also includes to, to show if we are talking about, for example, e mobility. Um, based concept uh, with yeah. the um, um, uh, impact that you you outlined also for the um, uh, for the car industry, um, what kind of overall and it, um, let's let's call it overall smart grid mm -hmm. is is needed and what kind of infrastructure um, we uh, need to to build up and what is also the role of of the public sector in this in this regard. Um, on, on infrastructure, uh, let Tommy Tommy and Ben, what do you think about? Um, electric vehicle infrastructure, um, building out the new infrastructures for these new technologies. Um, it really requires uh, you know, investment um, mm -hmm. from the private sector, but for at the state and local level as well. Where, where, where are your uh, well, objectives I, there? I think the, in the short term, the greatest economic crisis, uh, not economic, but environmental 
crisis or disaster for DC is Metro. The, <laughs> the, um, <laughs> the fact that people are, are getting off the trains and going back into vehicles is a, um, an environmental crisis for right. us. Mm -hmm. And when I, I was briefly on the Metro board, when I was on the Metro board, we were worried about, gosh, are we going to have enough trains to be able to run enough trains for the growth that's happening at Metro? Mm -hmm. And now, we don't know if we have enough riders to pay for the system. Mm -hmm. So the first thing is, is, is Metro. And it had been one of the greatest success stories of electrification mm -hmm. of mass transit in the country because, precisely because of the white collar ridership that folks that own cars that could afford for parking the city were choosing to take Metro inside. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the first thing. The second is, in terms of electrification, um, a lot of us are having these conversations now because of the Volkswagen settlement money. What do we do with the settlement money? And there's a lot of pressure to say, well, put more infrastructure in for electric cars. And what I push back in the city is, do I really want to make it easier for people to drive in from the suburbs mm -hmm. and charge their car in DC when actually I want to get them back on Metro? And for the public transit that we have, can we continue to improve our circulator system and at least the buses that run through here from, from Metro to electrify those buses and to be sure that we have the infrastructure for electric, electrifying those buses and then taking a new look <coughs> at our um, at the, the fleets in government that we use, the, you know, your garbage trucks and all those things that um, we can learn from Germany of what, how they're making those investments mm -hmm. to reduce the, the NOx gases along with um, the greenhouse gases. So in terms of electrification of, of vehicles, um, it's really the, the public transit where we need to make the investment. Yeah, I'll say I, I stopped riding the metro, but I started riding a bike. So, um, so I'm okay, but uh, yes, you are. <laughs> uh, yeah. But I can understand the motivation for people to stop riding the metro. So, could I could I just add in a few words on transportation because uh, for for the state of Maryland, as much of a priority as we put on the energy sector and other sectors involved in the climate change challenge for us in the state, transportation is really uh, a top priority. We we have uh, miles to go, uh, <laughs> and and. So the state is, uh, one of our priorities is transportation electrification. And uh, governor signed the Clean Cars Act last, uh, this past General Assembly, investing more uh, both uh, uh, rebates and incentives to individual consumers, but also uh, incentives for more electric vehicle infrastructure. And we know that the key to uh, game changing to, to have an even more electric vehicles uh, on I-95 and in the corridor and throughout the state of Maryland, uh, we need not just uh, private sector investments, but public sector in investments. And so mm -hmm. on the energy, uh, the, the grid of the future discussions that our Public Service Commission is having, one very important component of that is what role can the BG&Es, the, the uh, utilities, play in that. Uh, and just the other point, the last point is, um, as Tommy mentioned, the, uh, the silver lining of the, the Volkswagen settlement for, for uh, uh, states and jurisdictions that are going to get substantial funds, for us in Maryland, that's $76 million. There's absolutely going to be a major portion of that that will go towards not just electric vehicle infrastructure charging stations, but um, transportation electrification at our port. Uh, our Port of Baltimore uh, is the economic engine for the state and the uh, uh, conversion, uh, not just to vehicles, trucks, but also uh, heavy duty equipment. It is also a reason why our state, even if there's not as much federal action on mitigating greenhouse gases, we know that uh, vehicle um, transportation electrification will also reduce other pollutants that local communities are uh, threatened by. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is where our ozone uh, work, Tommy and I work together on the Ozone Transport Commission, which is 13 states, totally bipartisan throughout the, the uh, eastern uh, and mid-Atlantic areas of the US, and we're focused on reducing the transport of ozone. And it's connected to what we as a country and what we as uh, jurisdictions do on uh, greenhouse gases mm -hmm. as well. Um, 
something that Dennis mentioned uh, in the German context was um, reaching new audiences, um, creating messages that reach a, a broad away, array of audiences to try to get action at different levels. Um, now, DC, I think, had, what, three or four percent of voters voted for Donald, Donald Trump uh, this year. So I don't think you have that real issue here in DC. But Maryland has a, is much more diverse from a political perspective. And uh, particularly in the rural west and not on the eastern shore, mm -hmm. there are definitely people who question uh, the, the role that yeah. humans play in, in climate change. Right. Well, how do you think about that? Um, and, and making sure that these policies resonate uh, with you know a, a diverse group of people, uh, uh, particularly asking hard questions about climate change. Right, right. Mar Maryland is known, uh, for those of you who don't haven't heard this, is known as America in miniature, because it really does have uh, rural uh, elements uh, and also urban elements and a, a diverse mix of views politically. And the answer to the question is is that you focus on those win-win scenarios and situations. Um, you identify the, uh, the value of uh, risk mitigation mm -hmm. and uh, incremental uh, actions uh, locally and throughout the state that will benefit the citizens, regardless of where they are on the uh, political and ethical issues of, of the, the role of climate change. I mean, but Maryland, for our part, the commission, the administration, we're very focused on saying it is a real threat. Uh, the real question is not whether we do anything, it's, it's what do we do. And we absolutely need to build partnerships. We, agriculture is a very important uh, player in, in this role. And so he our healthy soils initiatives, carbon sequestration work, and recognizing that farmers, some whether they, whatever they feel about uh, the uh, causal factors of climate change or the existence of climate change, uh, many of them see uh, subsidence and sea level rise or uh, extreme weather events as a real risk to their livelihood and they want action uh, and and coordination on that front so it's it's not trying to isolate or uh, ostracize it's where do we bring people together and say we need to take certain actions and and that's where we have robust debates in our state climate change commission because uh, we we try to find consensus uh, and there are some areas that are very controversial that we, we're, not, we're not close to consensus on yet. Uh, one final question before we open up here. Um, I want, uh, and for each of you, um, we we're hoping to have a representative from the private sector on the panel, and unfortunately they had to cancel at the last minute. Um, and so I'd like to um, have, have some private sector folks comment on this, but I'd love each of you to say what you think the, the role of the private sector is in realizing your you know, national, state, local goals, uh, and how do you partner with them, and, and what more you can do, and what more the private sector can do. So Dennis, why don't you start? Mm. We'll just go down the row. Yeah, I think, um, um, as I mentioned, um, with respect to this um, Lima Paris um, action agenda and the, and the respective platform to, to bring in uh, different non-state actors, um, that is an overall opportunity to um, engage into a, a discussion who is going to, to contribute what in, in an overall transformation process. And that is very, very broad when, when it comes to different sectors to, um, to play a role, be it the energy, be it transport, we mentioned agriculture. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's quite different at, um, also when it comes to different countries because um, the, the um, question of adaptation um, is for, for some of the um, developing and uh, um, developing countries and emerging economies even, even more important in order to um, uh, see how they are able um, overall to, to cope with climate change and there also the um, it's, it's very important to, to bring in the, in the private sector be it um, through um, insurance companies um, new innovations in this regard mm -hmm. um, be it to um, uh, the overall um, investment structure what, what Tommy already mentioned um, the, the, the question of a green bank uh, mm -hmm. to bring in these mm -hmm. kind of um, um, new solutions um, also to, to um, um, pave the way for transformations of, of certain credit lines and that is quite popular already at, at a global um, 
at a global level, be it um, insurance, be it um, also green credit lines, um, in order to um, pave the way to um, the private sector to come in. And those are only two, because um, the other you know, innovations, um, in, for example, when it comes to um, the overall, uh, meeting the overall energy, um, demand is, is quite diverse um, with different um, options here in the United States, for example, compared to, to also other countries, also depending on the, the overall geographical conditions. But um, in, in, in any context, um, the role of the, of the private sector is, is, uh, is crucial. And I think the, um, the action agenda I mentioned is a quite good example to see that, that many, many companies um, ha um, have committed in, in order to, to contribute to this agenda. Well, I, I would just, just simply say that um, REGI, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, is a market-based, it's not a government-based initiative. And so one of the biggest and most important examples regionally and globally of the role of the private sector uh, in reducing greenhouse gas emissions is a market-based um, cap and invest program that, that Reggie is. And then the other point, which, which uh, Tommy and I talk about a lot, and that is uh, have science-based regulations, but how do you launch a restoration economy for the Chesapeake Bay? How do you provide incentives for um, engineering and consulting firms and technology providers to really get in the game? And, uh, and profit through the restoration economy. And that applies not just to saving the Chesapeake Bay, but also to um, approaches to climate change. Um, and our state is uh, in the midst of launching the largest offshore wind proposals in the country. That, uh, that doesn't mean they're without controversy, but there are a whole lot of businesses and private sectors involved in, and jobs growth involved in uh, responding, adapting to change and to the need for changing uh, choices and, and options on energy provision. So I'll just stop on that front. Yeah, <clears throat> not to fall into hyperbole, but I think that the role of the private sector is never been more important, and especially in America, in addressing climate change. The fact that we're having this panel, the road to bond, and there's not a federal representative sitting up here with us is something I would have never imagined. And that what that means is that each of our roles from local government, no longer, you know, it used to be and federal government and private sector work together to, um, to implement the values and the goals of our country. So that means that each player will be stepping up. And what we've seen with the private sector already is transformative. This whole Amazon RFP across the country they're very clear. They don't want to create a rural campus, which used to be the model of where they want to go. They're asking cities to come up with their proposals, and they will likely go to an urban area. And that's because when you look at the companies that are moving back into Chicago, into DC, is that their employees that they want to work there do not want to live in most sub many suburbs. They don't want to live in rural areas. They don't want to live on a company campus. They want what um, urban areas have, or well, yeah, urban areas have, but they also want the amenities that urban areas have, and they, and they bring their values and their goals. So you look at Oklahoma City, when it used to be known for the bombing, and that was it, and it was also per capita the fattest population in the country, which does not <laughs> attract companies very well because of the health care costs. And so we've had successive Republican mayors in Oklahoma City redefined what Oklahoma City is. And they're putting in biking trails, hiking trails. They rerouted the river back through the city and changing it to a city that is um, a healthier, stronger city in order to bring in the private sector and also for the type of folks that you, know, that you want to work in your emerging new um, company sectors that the, where they want to live. So I believe that the role of the private sector has never been more powerful in having the, um, the responsibility, but also the desire to help meet mm -hmm. the global climate change. I mean, just look, think about, I can't remember how many million um, of, of homes and areas were without power the um, night before last, but having a global economy and having your power down mm -hmm. is, is 
you can't have that happen. You can't have that happen in any of your major cities or any of your other areas. So you have to do resiliency and mitigation. And cities are, you know, have a major role in that. But again, um, the private sector, just like the, the local governments, have never been more important in addressing global climate change. Thank you. Uh, we'll turn it over to the audience. Um, uh, so questions, uh, say your name, uh, where you're from. Um, and if you're from the private sector, I welcome you to give a one minute spiel on what, you, what your company is doing. I think that would be very interesting in this, particularly in this context. And there's a microphone coming around. So we have right here. Uh, yes. Uh, Great panel. Thank you. Uh, John McIntyre, Georgia Tech, not the private sector, but very close to it, <laughs> since we work hand in hand with industry. Nice. And uh, I wanted to say uh, getting the private sector to participate in events like that is very hard. We've been doing, doing a conference every two or three years since 2006, sponsored by Coca-Cola at first, on the role of the NGOs and MEs, multinational enterprises, in what has now become the UN SDGs. So it's a great initiative, and I really regret the, the non-presence of a private sector person. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, several questions on smart cities. Uh, I'm impressed by, by the by your city. I was at UNDC, uh, your campus, uh, for the past few days. And uh, it really, I mean, it, uh, the, the air is a lot easier to breathe here than it is in Atlanta, I'll say that. Uh, but uh, smart cities, there's a lot to be learned from China, new cities starting from scratch. We, we have a number of research centers at Georgia Tech working hand in hand on uh, the advent of new cities that are redesigned, perhaps not to good intent, but in which all of the systems are really thought out as they are. So perhaps there are lessons to be learned from, from those initiatives. Uh, and then the second one is, what can we expect from the uh, COP 20, uh, 23 in Bonn, uh, which will be followed by, uh, I hasten to add, by a summit in Paris, which uh, Macron has called, uh, for December 12th to really uh, take stock of the uh, Paris Accord Agreement. Where are we? Where are we going? Um, that's it for me. <laughs> that's a lot to ask, but uh, have a shot at it. I'll, I'll say briefly, um, <clears throat> one of the other hats I wear is I'm the, the chair of the, the DC Water and Sewer Board. It's the largest modern water treatment plant in the world. and the rates are dramatically going up because we're also having to purify the water to a higher degree to clean up Chesapeake Bay and certainly our rivers. The smart city approach of how we don't have our utility rates go through the roof, it's going to have to be around demand management and smarter um, implementation of basic technologies around like our water sewage, um, sewage treatment plant. So that is an area that I believe that is going to have to be um, a major part of our future because of the, again, the infrastructure costs that we have in order to meet the clean water, the um, clean waters program in the city is, is quite a burden on the taxpayers. And so the hope is demand management. Yeah, I, I just want to add one, one point on the, uh, on the smart cities angle. Um, uh, so uh, kudos to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and to the Environmental Council of the States, which is the 50 or so environmental secretaries and directors around the U.S. We've developed, uh, there's this e-enterprise uh, program to modernize the business of environmental protection. And so the connection to smart cities for us as part of this US EPA and states partnership is on advanced monitoring of air and water. And these are exciting times. Uh, the explosion of technology uh, for uh, rapid real-time data on air pollution or water pollution is both encouraging and also daunting. And the private sector and the big private sector IT companies realize that's where the world is going. Uh, remote handheld data that you can pick up instantly on air quality in cities or, or water quality in local streams. The challenge and, and the role of government is to make sure that there's some type of 
third party certification program to identify, it doesn't have to be a government program, but the government really needs to identify what are these new technologies, how do you ensure that they are reliable, and that the information from those technologies uh, can be uh, acted upon in a responsible way so that we're not going off on some red herring or the public is overreacting on one thing or the other. And I think, so I think a real key to the exciting world of uh, the Internet of Things and, and smart cities is uh, having uh, some confidence that the sensors and the monitors are accurate. And not only that they're accurate, but that the information from those monitors is then used to make smart and responsible decisions. I think that's going to be one of the great challenges that all of us are going to have to work on. And in the, and in the climate change world, it, obviously, the monitoring of different types of emissions uh, is, is going to be a key component of that. But uh, I think smart cities is a great development, great trend, but it requires uh, public and private leadership, and, and from academia and the scientific community in particular. Dennis. Yeah. Um, a good question, basically. I, I think um, and there are different answers to the overall role of this Bonn COP. Um, uh, I think, um, first of all, um, we need to see that, that Germany is basically a technical host, um, but Fiji is um, the one to, to organize, um, uh, to host this. Um, um, climate conference, and I think that uh, the, this is basically a great symbol. If you, if you see that one of the countries really at a tipping point when it comes to climate change impacts with respect to sea level, sea level rise, really um, at, a, at a point where overall national sovereignty is, is at risk uh, in a way, is, is going to host this kind of um, conference, with, which means also that um, I think adaptation um, is, is um, um, a specific issue that will um, get some some um, attention here, and and also what when it comes to a certain kind of solutions. But that is um, from is one part of the story. Another is that um, uh, after Paris, um, now it's um, if we if we consider what um, also the. Uh, German delegation is doing basically the Paris Agreement somehow as a climate constitution of the world. Now you need to, to move over to uh, specify some of, of, of the rules, um, um, and quite a number of rules, um, to, to be honest. And um, we already mentioned that, for example, um, when it comes to um, mitigation, that um, uh, market mechanisms uh, play an, a, a very important role. Um, I think, Ben, you also mentioned um, with, with respect to Reggie that there are some discussions on uh, about linking mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, emission trading systems um, in, in order to, to form some kind of, of, of co uh, collaboration uh, to bring the, the emissions down. And actually, this um, is, is, is part also of the negotiations for, um, um, for Bonn um, when it comes to, to Article 6, um, and, and, um, which um, covers basic, uh, basically some of the um, um, key mitigation uh, activities. What kind of um, uh, arrangements uh, can can we build um, uh, supported by the, the international climate community in order to promote such kind of, of, mm -hmm. of cooperation for example linking uh, linking emission trading system but but even more to to um, strengthen the cooperation between um, uh, industrialized and, and developing um, our countries so um, it's an important step in, in Bonn and, and also then then afterwards this uh, the summit you you mentioned in, in Paris to to um, uh, continue this kind of trying to uh, design a rule book a Paris rule book uh, in a way and also to to link that to an ongoing effort of stock taking um, that has also to do um, uh, what, what you mentioned with, with the, the challenge to regularly monitor um, mm -hmm. progress and, and try to, to be flexible enough to um, adjust your um, 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 uh, activities accordingly in order to, to see that you really deliver the, the overall ambition of the Paris Agreement um, because based on the national determined contribution um, at um, um, how they are defined in, in those um, more than 150 national contribution it will contributions it, it will not be enough so it's um, uh, I think a timely um, uh, point in, in, in time by the French government to, to come up with an additional uh, summit in, in order to see what um, uh, what are remaining um, activities needed also to um, take the next step. Got a question here on the side. 
<clears throat> thank you, and great panel. Uh, Jean-François Boitin with the Energy Center at IFRI, a think tank in Paris. And I have a sort of broad question uh, centered on this country. Uh, isn't the current situation uh, on climate change a way to come back to what is the original model of American democracy? If you read Tocqueville, what he wonders, uh, what he really admires, is the way democracy works at the local level. And here we are, I think Maryland is a perfect example. You have a new administration, uh, does not change tack. So do we have to go at the local level uh, to find a way to have a model of democracy that works as opposed to uh, what we see in this city <laughs> at the <laughs> Congress level where, you know, climate change is a four-letter word for uh, old Republicans in Congress, isn't it? Who wants to take that on? I, I have to say I'm humbled by the question <laughs> and appreciate your um, perspective on history in terms of how America is viewed by the rest of the world. I think that in the debate of what kind of government we're going to have, a strong central government versus you know a government of, of primarily of local governments of the states, the argument for having a strong federal government was so that we would have the revenues necessary to pay our debts, but also to be able to, um, you know, from, from the Revolutionary War, but then also to make um, federal investments and also to allow um, um, commerce to occur between the states and such. So it's, it's truly a balance. I know that in a practical level that, and I think Ben would be interesting, I think you're having the same experience, losing the federal partner has been, you know, on the one hand, I try to reassure people, whether it be folks in other parts of the world or in America, look, we're going to step up, private sector is going to step up, the cities are, the, you know, are the answer to this, we're, we're working together and the, the, the future is possible. But the practical level, what it also experiences for me, is that um, we have a federal government that not only is becoming benign on this stage, but is actually working against and attacking um, the, the things that have been networked and cobbled together as a country, like the Clean Power Plan and such, that the federal government, by trying to reinvest in coal and try to discourage the investments in, um, in wind and, and other renewables, it's, it's not, I mean, it certainly is a test of democracy in ways that we even saw yesterday. But, um, not having the federal partner to help invest in new technologies and to support pilots and trial things and to coordinate that and to help us share information is, um, is a huge challenge and it's a huge loss. And, but I, you know, I can't understate that it also, we go to these meetings and we're not even sure what we can bring up. Now, Ben, you've been vocal at these meetings to not um, shy away from talking about global climate change, mm -hmm. human caused. Mm -hmm. We do have leaders um, from both sides of the aisle that are, are speaking up, but actually to have the federal government work against the local governments and being able to address this is shocking. Well, I, um, I, I would just simply say that, um, so I'm reminded of uh, what Tip O'Neill said, the famous uh, Speaker of the House, when he was frustrated by trying to get legislation through and all these different voices and views. And he said that uh, uh, the problem with, with democracy is that too many people get involved. Uh, <laughs> the beauty of democracy is that many people are getting involved, and that's overcoming the um, hesitations at the broader or federal level and uh, you are seeing uh, some states really step up and underscore that uh, on adaptation and resiliency there shouldn't be no doubt that action is needed uh, locally regionally and sometimes nationally when it's coastlines that span many uh, states and an and, and entire region on the greenhouse gas mitigation front and the, the big energy choices, uh, I, I, think, uh, I think you're right. You're, you are seeing a reaction 
that occurs in different pockets throughout the United States where uh, citizens at the local level and uh, policymakers at the state level are saying, well, we're going to build partnerships with the private sector, we're going to adopt policies to show we're even more committed and we're going to put more pressure on the need for uh, the uh, federal investment in science and, and uh, national leadership. And it's just, it's playing out in a way that's not always pretty, um, but it's certainly playing out and it's playing out in the courts too. I mean, I, the, the, the federal clean power plan, I mean, I, I would just say that there are uh, just you call balls and strikes. There are some legal questions presented by that regulation that uh, it may be the court, uh, uh, the Supreme Court, or a court decides um, they push the envelope too far. But the policy question is hugely important, and you're going to hear from states like Maryland and other states. We really need a federal driver. We need a, an important federal presence. Um, but then it, it really is a, a very political and, and uh, divisive issue. And so we're just the governor of Maryland is saying, well, let's focus on what we're doing. Uh, let's also be at bond and underscore the importance of action, not denial, but action on uh, climate and energy and environmental protection. To give a quick plug to the, for the Atlanta Council, uh, you know, this, this question of you know, local democracy, uh, you know, it cuts both ways. Uh, there were two dozen, two dozen states that sued uh, to, to fight the clean power plant. Um, and it's really about the message um, mm -hmm. and getting, getting, finding messages to reach new people. And we just got a, a pretty substantial uh, grant to go out and try to find new messages and new ways of talking about, uh, about climate action uh, to, uh, to really change the conversation and hopefully um, get all the various people who are involved to have a little more agreement on, on this topic. So I, I hope you all watch this space coming from the, from the council here. Um, question in the back. Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for an interesting and engaging panel. I'm Ken Markowitz, an environmental attorney and um, consultant with Aiken Gump, a big law firm here in Washington as well as on the board of the Verified Carbon Standard. So we do a lot of um, things on carbon offsets. I work primarily with the private sector, large multinational companies on their technology sides, widgets that help reduce greenhouse gas, whether or not it's something that's reducing the emissions from car engines, renewable fuels, energy efficient appliances, building materials, all of those types of things that are, have been encouraged for the last decade or more by our federal government. Tommy, you were saying it's never been more important for us as a private sector to show leadership. It's also never been more challenging because many of the companies that I work with have built big, large, billion dollar business lines based on federal policy, whether or not it's the CAFE standards for autos, which are now under attack on the midterm evaluation, and, and they capitulate. Okay, we're good with the 54, but now if I see a crack in that, maybe we'll bring it down. And this is a, you know, there's always outliers who are above that, but the general public, private sector are motivated either by self-interest mm -hmm. or by driven by regulation. And the ones that saw the self-interest and the, the combination with the, the regulation, if those are being pulled away and they're being pulled away rapidly by this administration, the faith in government to provide that basis, you know, to support all of this investment, they're not going to do it again. They've been burned and they're getting burned really bad right now as we watch the renewable fuels program get undermined, as we watch CAFE, as we watch the energy efficiency programs. And I'm worried that these are the leading companies. They're not the tech companies that really are ahead on things, but these are the core American manufacturing companies, you know, steel manufacturers who are looking for ways of collecting their emissions and turning them into fuels. Um, companies that are building new refrigerants that don't have global warming potential. And it's going to be very difficult to get them back again. Mm -hmm. So my question is, 
to primarily Tommy and Ben, but please, Dennis, jump in. The states can play a large role in holding the federal government's feet to the fire. And I know Maryland has had a very active attorney general in trying to make sure that certain of the federal regulation, uh, regulatory programs are upheld. Clean Power Plan, I think in the Waters case, Maryland has weighed in. What? How can you see your role using the law from a city perspective, from a state perspective, to try to at least maintain the status quo? Um, I've done a lot of international work, and in, throughout Latin America, there was always the theory of non-regression that if we get a new leader, our biggest challenge is just to keep the regulations where they are until a better administration comes in. Never really thought that was coming, you know, coming here. And now we are faced in a major crisis on the principle of non-regression. And the states and cities yeah. will play a very key role in trying just to keep that baseline in place while, you know, maybe new change will, will happen over time. I would say, uh, from a Maryland perspective, uh, you know, the governor um, has signaled in, on multiple occasions, it's not just the attorney general, but the governor of the state, um, that uh, we need to hold the line and we need to continue advancing on environmental protection. Uh, and that includes uh, uh, joining with other states and supporting the Clean Cars Program, California's, uh, with the California waiver, the option for California and other states to follow a more um, stringent or environmentally protective emission standards for, clean, for cars. Uh, the message that we're uh, conveying is uh, cooperative federalism means that it's not just state leadership, it's also federal leadership. Uh, that there are, are uh, reasonable investment-backed expectations from businesses and states, and uh, and given the um, mobility and interstate nature of things, uh, we really need um, leadership on uh, clean water and on uh, air quality, uh, whether it's ozone or having a federal driver for uh, mitigating greenhouse gases. We we need. Um, we, we don't like swinging too far in one direction or the other. We need to keep moving forward towards fishable and swimmable and towards reduced greenhouse gas emissions. And that means that EPA, EPA and other federal agencies need to be engaged and, and involved. Um, and that everybody, we all live downstream or we all live downwind. And that we really do need a federal uh, interstate umpire on some of these decisions and, and an investor in the science uh, that uh, any one state or, or a great academic institution can't handle on their own. You know, your question is a great question and it's one that we wrestle with. And it's one of those theoretical questions too. Do you use the markets that America is famous for or do you use regulation? And the truth is, is that I believe that we've made the greatest gains through regulation that where we force people to mm -hmm make cars that are cleaner to the CAFE standards. The Clean Water Act mm -hmm. has done a remarkable amount of cleaning up across the nation and it's direct regulation I think where we've made the, the greatest gains. So as that gets walked back, that is a major challenge. I, I think you're, mm -hmm. you've kind of laid it out there. Mm -hmm. But what can, let's say, cities do? One of the things that, that we're doing is um, at two levels. One is, is that we're banding together with other cities to buy electric buses. We have a, a local bus system besides the regional one. The local one has generally been diesel. And we're going to skip the natural gas step and go straight to electric. And um, I, I don't know if it's Alstrom or, or Proterra, I think is, is the company. But the way that they're being viable is that the cities are working together saying, together we're going to buy buses from you and they can make major investments to build their businesses. So that's not the only example, but cities are kind of come together with their purchasing capacity, which is extraordinary. But we also have to look at um, if we're going to retrofit the buildings of DC, we have all these incentives out there, these market incentives from, um, well, we, even the Green Bank will be incentives, but how we get to 
get the building owners to actually do it is probably going to be a regulatory answer. Um, New York City, as many of you know, just said, you know, if you burn coal or, or oil in order to heat your buildings, we're going to um, put a cost on that, either through fines or otherwise. There's a lot of pushback because we're used to in America do what you want with your property. But um, it's through a regulatory environment that they're going to make the gains that they're not able to do in the market. So that's a great question. Maybe just to, to add on, on, on the, um, to this, um, since you mentioned the, the, the role, uh, for example, of re refrigerants, um, which I think is a quite um, um, commonly overseen um, uh, climate damaging um, uh, sector. Um, and and from, from my experience, um, I would, for, for a company also, for, for in, in, a, in a multinational um, context, to, to see what, what, what is um, ongoing currently on, on other markets. I, I just um, was able to organize a green cooling event for the, um, on behalf of the EU in India. And in India you have, with, with respect is, um, to, to this sector, really um, uh, huge investments to come. Um, because currently in, 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 in this country only 4% have um, um, an AC. And, and are going to, and it's really an, an important um, element of, of the future um, development to, to get this kind of um, um, uh, um, uh, technology and also to, to uh, use it in a, in a most climate friendly way. And if I see that, and this is pretty much independent, of course, from, from, this, from this national market, um, in a way, there are um, um, uh, um, um, quite important trends um, on, the, on the markets with um, direct um, directing um, investments that should also be relevant for the the US market in one or the other way but it needs of course communication and it needs also the, um, to, to bring those um, kind of solutions to, to, to other markets as well and uh, I think that is also part of the um, um, of the answer um, normally um, not really in at the core of attention of a, a US company maybe at, at the moment but in, the, in a global perspective that this um, these countries like India like China the, the new markets are really committed to this um, Paris Agreement regulation. We have two questions up front, and we're running out of time, so maybe we take a third and put them all together. So, or are we just going to, and we have one over there. So these two, then one back there, all together, and then we'll rattle it off and call it a day. Two, two, quick, two, two, two quick questions, and maybe they're not, hopefully not too long answers. Uh, on the legal issue, on the legal front, uh, and the need for federal regulation, is there a danger? from a state and local standpoint of a preemption argument that the courts say, hey, look, you know, it's up to the federal government to decide what they're going to do in the regulatory space. This all doesn't involve interstate activities. And you don't have a right, state of Maryland, to have your own cap and trade or cap and invest system. I hope that's not the case, but I raise it as a question. Uh, second question or a point, how much of a role uh, is there for uh, you know city to city cooperation globally, state to state cooperation, state to lender cooperation with Germany, uh, and is that working, or does it just end up being a talk shop when those if you know we go forward with those kinds of things? Over to Bob. Uh, building on the point you made about global markets. Um, I work with uh, Obama's administration in the Energy Bureau, and Secretary Kerry was fond of talking about the size of the market for renewable energy technologies, and we'd always debate as to whether it was seven trillion or ten trillion or whatever. But it seems to me that there is a sort of a, a potential to really to focus, especially with the Trump agenda on trade and jobs, on the potential for exports of renewable energy. At least we're getting some signals that there is an all-of-above approach with regards to exports, even though LNG and coal may be on the top of the list. But um, And so some of the states, California, we always to run into Jerry Brown and the Californians in terms of marketing their system. How do you view that from your perspective in terms of Maryland and district in terms of goods, services, technologies, and can you do more to try to ensure that the U.S. is engaged in this commercial battle for markets? Final question, second row over to the left. 
Yeah, thank you. Sonja Teig is from the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies in Potsdam, Germany. Um, I actually just, I hope it's going to be a quick question um, to the American speakers, um, which is, so I, as I understand it now, there's these pretty much uh, well-established networks of sort of active cities, active states that promote these climate issues. Um, are you also reaching out to the, I know there's a lot of states uh, that are actually quite close by, a lot of cities that are close by, they're not doing much. Um, are you reaching out to these um, different actors as well? Are there any sort of channels that, that are already there that you can be using to promote this idea of climate protection, of, of sort of uh, transferring to renewable energy, that type of issue? Um, yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. So two questions that are somewhat similar on city to city, state to state uh, cooperation, and then reaching out to others that maybe not part of that. Um, so see if, there, uh, if, if there's any response to there before we go to the others. Well, go ahead. C40, which is now 90 cities, is one of the most important organizations in the world right now um, because of the role of cities. And C40, which is helped funded by Bloomberg and some, some other um, organizations, and led by Anne Hildago, the, the mayor of, of Paris, there's a lot going on in terms of that. And the question is, what's the role of bringing in smaller cities? We also have a group called ICLE, which is the smaller cities. And we stay engaged in that as well. I do see that all the time, I'm sure this is true for Ben as well, the number of invitations that I'm getting for conferences or signing on to agreements or working with other jurisdictions is overwhelming. It's, it's a tidal tsunami of all these, you know, I don't know which thing to go to, but it's, it, there is this level of, of urgency and investment going on across the country of local jurisdictions. One of the things that I do hope that Ben speaks to is the question that the ambassador brought up, I believe, yeah. about, um, about federal and, and local where Governor Hogan has filed suit regarding, um, I believe, the, the, the scrubbers and, mm -hmm. and such, and just mm -hmm. very quickly, which is maddening and unbelievable, is that many of you know that when, where, where you still build coal-fired plants, that a number of them are built, the modern ones, with scrubbers that reduce the amount of carbon that comes out of these dirty plants. And states choose not, or companies choose, not necessarily the states, not to run their scrubbers because they can make more money and reduce the cost of burning coal by not cleaning it. And so when you're downwind, they're choosing to send more carbon your way. And Marilyn's going to test this question. You should. Yeah, say yeah. The, about uh, that. And, and we're not preempted by federal law. In fact, it, it is pursuant to federal law that a state can uh, petition the EPA and now file suit. Uh, for EPA to step in to in, ensure that um, 19 coal-fired power plants in five upwind states run their NOx controls uh, when they need to the most, and that's during the summer, the hot ozone summer season. Um, I I, uh, I would I just um, I j I was fortunate to just return from a trip to Serbia, where the state of Maryland is reaching out and, and well, Serbia invited us to come to uh, meet with their Minister of Environmental Protection, their Minister of Mining and Energy. Uh, they, they have a new Environmental Protection Department, and they're very focused on air, water, m energy, land. And I sense that there's some real opportunities where uh, at the subnational level, you would know this better than anyone uh, as, a, uh, as a diplomat, that uh, even if there's not engagement at the federal level necessarily, uh, some states are eager to not just sign agreements, to actually get projects and technologies coming to Maryland or Maryland businesses and technology companies going to uh, Serbia or any other country that's interested in cleaner coal technologies or cleaner water or sewer upgrades and infrastructure and you know I, I'm excited about that uh, as you know not just for Maryland but for the greater global commons the, those types of subnational arrangements and uh, agreements and, and I, I know we're committed to 
um, particularly on projects like offshore wind or other energy and climate related efforts uh, reaching out beyond uh, our colleagues in the states or at the federal level and you know if there's interest internationally and, and which is another reason why we're excited to be going to Bonn. Dennis, did you want to talk about that? Yeah, I think um, what we um, are witnessing um, is that there has been an increasing exchange on a city by city uh, level that there are um, uh, um, quite some um, interesting um, uh, arrangements like the uh, C40, what, what you mentioned, um, ICLE is, is, is very active, um, the um, uh, global covenant um, on, um, of mayors on climate and energy that, that can help to, to exchange um, experiences and, and also jo um, um, promote joint uh, a joint focus on, on different kind of solutions, sector-wise, for, for example. I think that is um, also the, when it comes to transatlantic context, uh, the transatlantic climate bridge with, with some support for also to, to, to promote study tours um, uh, in, in both directions um, at, at this level. I think there are some limitations. Um, availability of time and, um, and resources is, I think, um, are quite important in, in, in this regard. Um, on the other hand, um, that can really help to, to um, um, promote joint learning curves, um, for example, when it comes to building codes for energy efficient buildings um, or any kind of um, um, uh, transport, um, sustainable transport um, solutions, and uh, hopefully um, also the, the overall environment of this bond conference can again help mm -hmm. um, to, to highlight some of the um, solutions and, and to, to promote the exchange. Um, up to the level where city planners are coming into the, the game. It's, I think, not only about city representatives, but it's, um, it's a broader debate that um, we, we need in this regard. Final question, Bob's question on uh, export uh, options for uh, renewable energy. Uh, what are you seeing? Yeah, that's an interesting question because um, I'll just give an example. It doesn't cover the whole field, but in DC, I'd say about 15 years ago, we had one or two solar-related companies. Now we've got 40 to 50 solar-related companies, and they're small companies. And they're related to either the financing or deployment and such. And now that there's so much emphasis on figuring out what microgrids are and what microgrids can do, mm -hmm. it's, um, you know, we're, we're having studies done. We're figuring out how to work with our, our power companies to microgrid. Now we look at countries in Africa and elsewhere where the old model and parts of India and, and elsewhere, the old model is you create this huge grid with these large power sources to generate energy. And if you're using um, coal or, or any fossil fuel, then you're recreating the problem that we already have done. So already, there's been informal conversations. Um, I guess because the State Department such would not be formal conversations, of course, but informal conversations of sharing technology around how to microgrid with solar. And now that you add in battery technology, it's, um, it's truly going to, you know, I don't know if that's going to be the, the magic bullet, but there's a lot of interest in developing countries to deploy solar in microgrids in towns and villages. And that, I think, is a real opportunity for DC that I'm trying to figure out <laughs> how can I help support that. Fantastic. Anyone else? I, I would just say that Tommy has a beautiful B on his tie uh, <laughs> clip. And it reminds me that in the next week or two, uh, there's going to be uh, an, an important initiative. Maryland passed legislation recently on pollinator-friendly solar sites. And it's a wonderful combination of advancing renewables to fight climate change, move transition to a cleaner uh, energy uh, future, and also tap into the critical importance of uh, food and habitat and so looking for opportunities where uh, there are win-win multiple situations. And I know we have a lot to learn in Maryland, but we're very enthused about that. And we're also, you know, it, the agriculture plays such an important role. And sometimes uh, there needs to be just really good discussion 
And uh, so one of our big discussions in Maryland, which does not have a lot of land, uh, is as we try to advance our aggressive and meet our aggressive renewable portfolio standard needs for solar or, and wind and other renewables, how do we try to manage and avoid conflicts between working farmland and solar facilities? And so that's one of the local government, one of the real debates in Maryland is how do you find common ground and a, a good win-win and uh, I'm excited about that and, and I think our experiences, uh, we actually, uh, we hope to import uh, information and knowledge and that's one of the other reasons for going to Bonn is learning how other countries that are doing remarkable work in uh, solar and wind and other technologies, uh, clean energy technologies are, are finding that a way to do that both from an economic perspective, but also a social, uh, you know, work work with the communities or, or impacted uh, property owners. That's a fantastic place to end. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you, Dennis, Ben, Tommy, the German Embassy for co-hosting. Uh, I hope that you all uh, come back to uh, more events here at the Atlanta Council, and we hope that you all will come back to do more events here, uh, and, and maybe we can partner with you out, out in Maryland and in, in, around D.C. So thank you all. I hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.